Hi everyone, good morning, good morning. I'm really glad to be here with you today. Um, if you are here to learn about root causes and why they're important uh, in relation to our non-traditional STEM and CTE pathways, you're in the right place. Uh, so we're gonna be uh, having a really, hopefully a rich discussion. I, I know that some of you may be in a position of kind of only kind of sit and get today, but if you have the capacity to, to tune in, I think that it'll be worth your while. Um, and I really do hope that you'll engage with us. Uh, as Brittany said, my name is Megan Pollock. My company is called Engineer Inclusion, and I get to work with organizations and institutions all over the globe, helping them to intentionally engineer inclusion into their organizations. Uh, I began my work um, as a consultant and a business owner really focused on STEM and, and career technical education, and that's because I'm an engineer. Um, my background is in engineering. I worked for as an engineer for Texas Instruments before starting my doctoral work. Um, at Purdue University, so not too far from you all, um, in engineering education. And my goal was to transform the culture of engineering. And that really opened up a lot of pathways in working with educators, um, probably like many of you, uh, and addressing some of these equity issues. I want to enter, um, I'm also based in a small rural town in Southeast Texas called Orange. My colleague who has already introduced herself in the chat, Elizabeth Johnson, she's going to be sharing some resources with you um, throughout the, the, the event. So if you want to kind of tune into the chat, um, but you're always welcome to just email me afterwards if you miss something. So as Brittany suggested, this is part of a series. So today we're gonna to be talking about understanding root causes and, and we are gonna be introducing root cause analysis um, and how to do it um, and give you some time to kind of practice that today. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna come back for workshop two where we're gonna dive into what are the top 10 root causes. And so you'll have an opportunity to investigate some of those most common root causes um, that affect equity in, in CTE and STEM. And then on March 5th, I'm going to be joining you all for your community of practice meeting. And this is going to be much more sort of discussion based where we're integrating the workshop learnings. And then back on the 12th of March, we're going to come back together for another session, um, strategies for engineering inclusion and belonging. So really practical strategies for systematically creating inclusive environments, really using those data driven approaches. So our agenda today, um, I had planned for well, we have 90 minutes planned. Um, that's correct, right, Brittany? <laughs> um, and the goal was to work in a five minute break near 11. Um, <clears throat> but I want to just kind of read the audience and see what it is that you need. So what I have planned today in this Slido poll is to kind of get us warmed up is I've got different Slido polls throughout the day, uh, throughout the session to, to kind of hear a little bit more from you. But I am curious to hear from you, your name, your role, and why did you choose to be here today? So if you've never used Slido before, um, you can take a smartphone, uh, swipe over to your camera and hover over that QR code. It's gonna be the same QR code that we use throughout the same, throughout the session. So you'll never have to scan the QR code again. And then the questions will always just pop up. Um, and then you could also go to slido.com and enter in that number 2534411. If that is a little too burdensome, you are absolutely welcome to chat, put your, your feedback in the chat. Um, but if you put it on the screen, then we're all looking at it together. So we've got a couple of people participating. Thanks so much for, for being the first ones. I'm excited to, to hear who, who you are, what your role is, and why you chose to be here today, or maybe what you hope to get out of your learning experience today. And while you all are typing, I, I feel the need to apologize. I'm recovering from a, a sinus infection of sorts, so I'm still a little... Um, sniffly and coughing so please pardon um, pardon me throughout our time as i'm kind of hacking a little bit all right arian taylor thank you so much um excited that you're here glad that you're uh, ready to learn something new um i've got a few other people typing if you've never used slido um it's a great tool it allows you to see you can see up in the top um, here who's contributing and the top right tells you how many people have participated. 
Um, we've got Tasha Allen, Senior Director for CTE, the Illinois Community College Board. Excited to learn about women in STEM and to be able to pass on best practices. Excellent. Well, Tasha, um, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I've got tons of resources. Um, you all probably will notice like there's going to be an absolute bias to all of the language of talking about women in STEM because that is both my lived experience and where my, my heart and passion is. All right, Joy is a Perkins specialist wanting to learn more about how to influence culture to be more inf inclusive at the college. Fantastic. Thank you so much for participating. Um, all right, and Sharon, um, you have an IT training program for diverse populations. Fantastic. Whoops. I'm gonna let, sorry, you can I, let the last person finish. I was trying to turn on the laser pointer. Um, all right, well, I think we got everyone. If, if I miss you, um, oh, one person's still typing. We'll let them finish and then we'll move on. Okay, so I'll, I'll sort of introduce the, the next concept. We're gonna be talking, as I said, about root causes and why it's important to understand what are some of the root causes for equity and inclusion with diversity, equity, and inclusion within your populations, on your campuses, within your sphere of influence. But it's really important for us to recognize that um, if you're familiar at all with Stephen Covey's spheres of influence, <clears throat> he popularized this sort of concept of like recognizing your sphere of control, your sphere of influence, and then what are those things that you care about, but you don't have any control or influence over. And so I want us to think about that, but I want to acknowledge here we got Maria Rosa, Director of Compliance, City Colleges of Chicago. Excellent. Thank you so much for participating. So as I was saying, when you think about Stephen Covey popularized this, but it actually comes from like ancient Greek and Roman Stoic philosophy. Um, but it's recognizing what can I control, what can I influence, and what do I need to let go of? And so when we think about how we're going to move through the next 90 minutes, and as you think about the work that you do, I want you to always kind of reel yourself back in and recognize what can I control, what can I influence, because there's a lot of things that we can't control, right? So I live in the state of Texas, a state that has like literally outlawed my work in like public schools. I cannot control that, right? And I barely can have any influence over that. So there's some things that I just kind of have to let go and do what I can within the realm that I can, right? So whatever that might be for you um, is something that you have the opportunity to kind of help yourself. Um, Elizabeth, if you'd find that link on our website on the, the where, on the circle of influence, that'd be helpful to the participants. Thanks. Absolutely. So I want to introduce a couple of definitions just in case. I know we've got some Perkins and CTE folks, so none of this is going to be new to you, but just in case we have some people who might have different understandings of these words, I want to just kind of set us on the same page here. So I'm going to be using the term non-traditional career throughout the event. Um, we're certainly focusing on women in STEM. But non-traditional careers, this is a term that is from the Perkins legislation. Now, a non-traditional student is somebody has a different meaning, but a non-traditional career is anyone in which one gender represents less than 25% of the workforce. So, for example, women in engineering or men in nursing. So many of these careers are high wage, high demand jobs, and it's imperative that we remove barriers and increase the participation and completion of women and men in these non traditional educational pathways. And so really this workshop is aimed to kind of equip you all with tools and strategies uh, for for addressing those needs. And so as an example, some non traditional careers for women might be auto mechanic electrician computer science law enforcement enforcement. So there are some examples there. This list is certainly not comprehensive and non traditional mm -hmm. careers for men might be massage therapy nursing early childhood education and so forth. There are more non traditional careers for women than there are non traditional careers for men. And the next thing I want to introduce a term that I might be using is special populations. So special populations is also a Perkins term, and <clears throat> it means any one of these things. It means individuals with disabilities, individuals from economically disadvantaged families, individuals preparing for non-traditional fields, which is uh, one of the core focus areas of this. And then you can see there are additional 
special populations. So with the definitions behind us, let's dive in. So we're, I'm going to give you the definition, but I want to hear first from you, what do you think is a root cause? And I'll make it even simpler. How would you describe a root cause to a five-year-old? So I don't need a big academic answer, but what is a root cause? What do you think it is? You're welcome to unmute as well, um, or you can type your answer in on the Slido. What do you think? How many of you have a five-year-old who wants to know why all the time? Or have ever had a, a toddler? What do you think a root cause is? How would you explain it to a kid? It's a basic reason why. Yeah, great. Um, Brittany says she has two around that age. Lots of why questions. Yeah, so a root cause is like really getting to the bottom of the why. And so with that, I want to show this really short video that talks about root, what is a root cause and why we need to find it. I'm going to hit play. For whatever reason you're not hearing audio, please let me know. How often do you ask why? And when you do, how often are you satisfied with the first response? If you've ever had a conversation with a young child, do they commonly accept the first response? Try to leave it, don't pull it off. Why? Because it needs to heal. Why? That's your body's way of healing itself. Why? Because you're a strong boy. Why? And the body is a miracle. Why? And resilient. Why? Researchers have explored why young children ask so many why questions and conclude that children are motivated by a desire for explanation. Results indicate that when preschoolers ask why questions, they're not merely trying to prolong the conversation. They're trying to get to the bottom of things. When it comes to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we've got to keep asking why. If we don't keep asking why, we won't get to the bottom of things. We need to find the root cause. The root cause is the core issue, the highest level cause that sets in motion the entire cause and effect reaction that ultimately leads to the problem or problems. Too often, we fall flat when we see the symptoms and problems, and we just stop there. For example, let's take a look at a tree and consider non-traditional careers and pathways. A non-traditional career is one in which a single gender represents less than 25% of the total number of workers. What we see first are the symptoms like participation, performance, persistence. If we look a little deeper, we can identify some problems like awareness and interest. But the root cause is the why. Why aren't students interested or persisting? Some causes can include culture and climate, access, opportunity, policies, bias, and stereotypes. There are many root causes for inequities in education and in the workforce, and they often work together in complex ways. Until we verify and deeply examine the root causes for our particular population, we won't fully understand why we see the symptoms and problems that we do. So what can you do? Well, first, read the research, understand the root causes. Next, make a hypothesis of which root causes might be at play. And finally, conduct a root cause analysis to identify and verify underlying causes and barriers before you dive in with an intervention. A root cause analysis is a structured process that assists in identifying underlying factors or causes of an adverse event. Understanding the contributing factors or causes of a system failure can help develop actions that sustain the correction. Otherwise, we keep trying things, burning our time, energy, and budgets on solutions that don't address the root cause. So remember, act like a child and don't stop asking why until you get to the bottom of things. How often? All right, so in that, I really love that video from, from Pink's movie, talking with her, with her child. 
and asking all the questions about why. And that's really the kind of practice that we want to take. And so, you know, I have this imagery in the video and what, what we often recognize is that, you know, we see symptoms, we see problems. And so often people think, you know, for example, for women in STEM that they say, well, women just aren't interested in STEM. Well, folks, interest is not a root cause. That is a problem that is a function of other kinds of external influences. And so our challenge is to really get to the bottom of things and begin to think about some of those root causes. And so how we do that is we can start with our data, right? Um, so we know that data needs to be ready to disaggregate across demographics for special populations. And so disaggregated data is data that's been broken down by detailed subcategories, for example, by marginalized group, gender, region, or level of education. <clears throat> Next, the data must be accessible to educators and administrators for disaggregated reporting. And so disaggregated data it can reveal deprivations and inequalities that may not fully be reflected in aggregated data, and it may not be fully reflected in what we can physically see. And so the next part is that we must equip and train staff to analyze data in search of equity gaps because of intersectionality, the overlapping ways in which our identities can affect our experiences. Disaggregated data is essential for understanding root causes. It's important to note, however, that data alone won't help us improve equity and access for students from special populations or for women in STEM. We have to do the work to get to the bottom of things. The data is just a tool to help us begin to recognize some of those issues. Um, and so while we are consistently working to improve our data, because no, I've never met a data system that's perfect, uh, we can begin to address the barriers that students face. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So first, I want you to think about what do you notice? So when I work with clients to do comprehensive root cause analyses, I help them to, to set up what I call a hypothesis. The hypothesis would be these four areas, population, whether that's based on gender, race, ethnicity, class, special population, or some other group. There's a focus. If we're going to stick to the sort of Perkins number or let the Perkins language, it might be participate, complete, or concentrate. And then program would be the specific pathway that you're talking to. And then the root cause is the final bucket. But what I want us to focus on is like, what do you notice in your sphere of influence? I've got a couple of examples here. Maybe you notice that Hispanic women don't participate in engineering because we'll figure out how to get to the root cause later. Or maybe you notice that girls don't concentrate in programming because of question mark. We don't know what the root cause is yet. So I want you to share with us, what are some of the symptoms and problems that you notice in STEM and CTE and that you'd like to discover a root cause? So what are some of the areas where you, again, within your sphere of influence and control are noticing symptoms and problems? Maybe from the data, the data is telling you this, maybe it's observation. What's something that you're focusing on? Or you're curious about, maybe you, you haven't initiated a, a big focus on it yet, but you're just curious. So what's something that you're thinking about? All right, so the first person shared here, a lack of representation of the gender and faculty for a non-traditional field. So you're in a rural setting. Is it because of the rural area or something else? That's a great question, right? And so as the video suggested, when we really get to the root causes, they there are lots of root causes and the truth is is we actually know all of the root causes and and the second session is we're going to go over the literature for the the most common root causes for participation in stem <clears throat> but they typically work together right so especially i like how you're bringing in multiple multiple influences right so you've got the influence of the rural setting you've got the non-traditional field so you've got those barriers in of them in and of themselves i also am in a rural setting and I look at the things that they post in the newspaper, you know, around the CTE pathways and there is absolutely not gender or racial diversity within those. Um, 
And so we can begin to explore those. Anybody else have something that, that you think about within your sphere of influence? Surely somebody else has something else they'd like to add. Again, you're welcome to unmute and contribute. If you think of something, I want you to add that in the chat. Okay, so how we begin to answer that question is we could do a five why analysis. And so a five why analysis would be something like this. You ask the question why. So if we go back to your response, so why is there a lack of representation of the gender and faculty for a non-traditional field in a rural setting? Well, then you come up with an answer. Well, we think that there is a lack of uh, gender diversity in a non-traditional field in a rural setting because of insert definition. And then from there, <clears throat> then you would say the next answer. So why is that the answer? So maybe our first answer is there's a lack of gender diversity because there are a lack of women within those fields altogether. Um, and so, when you're doing a 5Y analysis, you might see that it takes a split. So you might have two splits of one addressing the rural rural setting and the second 5Y analysis would be to focus on the gender representation. So, because they're, they're gonna come up with different root causes, right? And so again, imagine this, te technically what it's called when you have multiple 5Ys is you actually, it creates what's called a fishbone analysis but you're creating multiple five whys to get to the multiple kinds of root causes. And so again, the five why analysis is just taking the answer and then asking why is that? And then taking the answer and asking why is that? And so I'm gonna hold on to the example that you offered and we'll come back to that. But I wanna give a few sort of formal, um, formal uh, examples here. So one is from uh, Perkins numbers 5S1. So um, our, our, our problem statement here can focus on the sort of quality indicator 5S1 for special populations. And so the question we would ask would be, why are special populations attaining rec recognized post-secondary post credentials disproportionate to all CTE students? So a response might be, well, they're not in CTE pathways that lead to credentials. So then we ask why? Well, why are special populations not in CTE pathways that lead to credentials? We might think, well, they're not interested. So then we keep asking why? Well, why are special populations not interested in CTE pathways? A reason might be the language used to market CTE pathways doesn't appeal to them. Well, why doesn't the language used to market CTE pathways and not appeal to special populations? Perhaps we are using non-inclusive language and imagery that perpetuates stereotypes. So then we ask why? Why are we using non-inclusive language and imagery that perpetuates stereotypes? And some of those answers could be, we've not integrated student voices, We've not researched recommended practices for inclusive language and imagery, or we've not trained staff on how to reduce stereotypes. So once you kind of get to those three root causes, then the next step is to go verify if those are true. So let's look at another example. So 5S2 is the percentage of CTE concentrators graduating from high school, having attained post-secondary credits in the relevant CTE program or program of study earned through a dual or concurrent enrollment. Again, this is federal language, but I want you to know what the 5S2 is. So the prompt here is why are special populations graduating high school with fewer dual or concurrent enrollment credit, credits? An answer, <clears throat> an answer might be, excuse me, <coughs> why are, an answer might be there are disproportionate numbers of special populations who are CTE concentrators. So then we ask why are special populations not earning concentrator status in CTE pathways? Well, an answer might be the special populations may be less likely to be advised by counselors to consider CTE pathways. Why might counselors not be advising special populations to consider CTE pathways? 
And so again, as I'm doing this example, I want you to be thinking about your population, about your sphere of influence and control and, and find some parallels. So if we ask why my counselors not be advising special populations to consider CTE pathways, a reason might be is that counselors, they just may not believe that CTE pathways are ideal career options for special populations, or they may just think of them in other pathways and, um, and be sort of biased towards those recommendations. So why may counselors not believe that the CTE pathways are ideal career options for special pops? Well, potentially because of deeply rooted cultural stereotypes about college and career that many of us hold and that are prevalent within our, within our society. And then why might that be the case? Well, because we've not provided training or put systems in place to reduce the impact of this ideology. So again, the next step in this would be to go test and make sure that that root cause is actually the root cause. Because just because we do a root cause analysis doesn't actually mean it's the root cause. It means it could be the root cause. The next step, and then we'll talk about process improvement, is how we go about testing that. So I've got one more example, and then we're going to uh, do one collectively. So. This one is a 5S3 example. So 5S3 is a percentage of CTE concentrators graduating from high school having participated in work-based learning. So the prompt here is why are CTE concentrators from special populations graduating high school without participating in work-based learning disproportionate to all CTE concentrators? First thought might be, well, special populations are not getting selected for the few available work-based learning opportunities. Well, why is that? Why aren't special pops getting selected for work-based learning? Well, work-based learning partners say that they are selecting the best candidates. Well, why do work-based learning partners believe that the best candidates are not from special populations? They describe the selected students as having the right schedule, transportation, and quote, fit within the team. So why is that? Why might special populations not have the right schedule, transportation, and quote, fit? Perceived fit may result from stereotyping, and schedule and transportation result from a need for extended services. So then why might stereotyping and a need for services be an issue? Because we've not trained our work-based learning partners, and we've not surveyed students to determine their service needs. So again, the next step would be to go and verify this. So as you've seen in these three examples, in order to test this, we have to keep asking why. And you might have multiple root cause analysis five whys using this template. And especially if you've got like the, the example that somebody put into the Slido is that the combination of rural and non-traditional that could create different kinds of root causes, right? The challenge to attract professors to a rural area may be different than the challenges to, to attract professors to Chicago, for example, right? Um, oops, I've got my slides duplicated here, pardon me. Okay. So I want us to practice. Why do you think only 14% of associates degrees in engineering technology go to women, go to women? Well, maybe they aren't seeing those pathways for them with within pre college options. Well, why aren't they seeing that pathway in pre college options? Maybe they live in rural schools that don't have engineering or engineering trajectory type courses. Well, then we could ask why aren't there engineering or engineering trajectory courses within rural communities? It could be a lack of funds, a lack of teachers. So again, we can keep going down there. So somebody contributed here, potentially a lack of encouragement for girls in lower grades to engage in STEM that inhibits them taking courses in high school to prepare. Yeah, so 
So my undergrad is in computer science and my master's is electrical engineering, but I can kind of share a personal example of, of my experience. So I grew up actually here where I live now in Orange, Texas. I left for 21 years and just moved back summer before last to be uh, closer to my folks. And here in Southeast Texas, the most sort of common industry is um, oil and gas and, and, and tech, uh, uh, chemical plants, right? So we've got Dow and Chevron and all these kind of chemical plants right here on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And we also had a major industry of, um, of paper mills, but the paper mill that had been here my entire life just closed in December. And they lost like a thousand jobs. Um, people lost a thousand jobs. That was really, really sad. Uh, for my community, and I'm still really not sure what that means for my town, but um, those are there's two major industries. And so for me growing up, we actually had really, really great teachers, um, even for a small rural school. Um, I can't actually figure out, you know, maybe why they came to this area, but, um, but I think that, uh, or, or why I got to have those teachers, because when I look at the education that my brothers had, they had very different experiences um, within our education system. But we had, I had, I had a really stellar education from a public school system here within Texas. And what I mean is I started programming in eighth grade and I actually had a woman teacher. Um, so she decided that she wanted to teach us programming. And so she, we had this cohort and she moved with us from, from eighth grade into high school. And so I basically took like five years of programming, which back in the 90s and early 2000s was pretty unheard of, especially in a rural community. And so when if we did a 5Y of like, how did I end up in computer science? A certainly big influence of that was Miss Edith Passmore wanting to teach. So she learned how to teach it and, and taught that for us. But what's interesting in my own career path is I didn't choose that pathway. I actually, initially my uh, career choice, I, I had registered for college to study interior design. Now there is nothing on interior design, but there is also nothing in my childhood experience that sort of led me to that because I had been president of the robotics club. I had all of these other, you know, influences. My dad's a um, self-taught computer scientist and engineer. And um, so I had all of these sort of familial influences that should have put me into that pathway but there was just enough other influences that said, oh, but this isn't for women. One of those was my grandma, right? Grandma said, women don't become engineers. Um, there was lots of influence from my peers that said I shouldn't become an engineer. And so when we talk um, in a few weeks and look at some of the key root causes, we'll begin to sort of identify all of the different kinds of influences that these things could be. But it wasn't until I got offered randomly a full scholarship to go study engineering and computer science that I was like, okay, I'll take that. That's the path of least resistance. And no, oh, yeah, I am interested in this. Like, I've always loved this, but I couldn't see myself in that career. And when I say I couldn't see myself is when I looked around in my community, nobody who looked like me was working in the STEM pathways. And the STEM pathways meant paper mill or chemical plants. And those were neither places that I wanted to work because the paper mill is super stinky <laughs> and the chemical plants, they wore ugly uniforms and they worked really awful hours. Like my friend's dads would go into shutdown mode. I didn't know what that meant as a kid, but what that meant is like, they'd never see their dad. <clears throat> and so if that's my only influence of STEM, then it was definitely not appealing. So again, when we go back to the sort of prompt here is that understanding the five why could mean that we ask people for their stories, right? We ask if we, if we can't get to the bottom of things, then we have to use sort of empathic engagement, engaging with people to tell their stories to help us understand the different kinds of influences. We could certainly dig into the research and kind of help us understand what are some of those reasons why. But if we start with like this potential lack of encouragement for girls to engage in STEM, right? So that lack of encouragement could come from different things. It could come from shows that maybe their parents watch like The Big Bang Theory, that even though it has girls in STEM, the girls in STEM 
kind of have these personas that that conflict with what society is telling them they should be right so maybe there's these media influences or maybe it's just a sort of subtle ways in which we're told over and over and over again that math is not for us the research tells us that girls start to choose is and this is getting earlier and earlier every single year the girls are choosing now in between third and fourth grade they're making a decision that says math is not for me Even though they go on to have, they take more math and science classes than boys, they have higher math and science GPAs, but they still think it's not for them. And it's because of these broader cultural messages. And even though I gave an example of like my grandma saying, women don't become engineers, that was certainly not the message that my parents gave me, right? My parents were incredibly supportive. So I had planned for us to do a breakout here where you would go in and practice a 5y analysis of your chosen area but i want to check in and see if if that's going to cause everyone to drop off i want to do it last um so maybe that's what we will do because I, i i get a sense that some of you are kind of in listen only mode and so maybe we'll share this break we'll save this breakout until the end that gives you a chance to really practice this does can i get some signal from everyone whether that sounds good for you or not in a way um okay so we're going to come back to the breakout room because i don't want to lose everyone but essentially after you do a 5y analysis you come back to this sort of hypothesis And so, for example, we might determine that Hispanic women don't participate in engineering because of class climate, like what's actually happening in that climate. So class climate might be, for example, um, when I was in my circuits class at Texas Tech, um, um, on the on the one of the early days of the the class, um, the professor who I, I deeply cared for because he was actually the person who worked at Texas Instruments to, that founded the whole scholarship that paid for my entire bachelor's and master's and, and multiple co-ops. So I really cared for him, but he had deeply rooted cultural stereotypes. I'm sorry, my my dog is going a little nuts. She got spayed yesterday, so she's not having uh, she's having a rough day, I think. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so Dr. Cox was one of my favorite teachers because he had so many great stories. But then one day um, he queued up to tell a story and he was like, who knows something about trains? So I shot my hand up from the front row and he's like, Megan, you're a girl. Why would you know anything about trains? So in this class, I was the only female in a class of 70 students. And so this is an example of what class climate might be. So now in this moment, this professor, who I really like and care about, says, of all of the people in the class, you are the one person who shouldn't know this, right? So that creates a climate for me that says, I'm different. You're a girl. Why would you know anything about trains? And I I grew up in Southeast Texas. I just mentioned all these refineries and things. So like I'm surrounded by train tracks. I didn't live on the tracks, but I lived near the tracks growing up. Um, and, And so I felt like I knew something, but that created when he said that I already knew I was different but that created a very different climate for me. And with the literature, we call that like a chilly climate because it made me definitely not feel like I belong. And belonging is a really core part of a student's participation. So what once you get this hypothesis because you've established and you might have multiple hypotheses based on the five whys that you do. So then the question is like, so what do we do next, right? Um, how do we dive deeper into really understanding what happens? What many people do is that they just start throwing what feels like throwing spaghetti at a wall to see what sticks. Well, we think this is the root cause, so we're just going to start doing this, this, and this. We're throwing resources around. We're trying to solve the problem because we have the best intentions, right? We have the best intentions to solve the problems. But the truth is, is that we should not be diving into solutions yet. We got to hold our horses before driving in and creating solutions because we're not actually sure that that example of like the chilly climate or the classroom climate is the root cause. We have to test that. And so what we then do is that we identify the root causes as we've suggested, 
we start with those effects, the symptoms and problems, and we do the analysis to get to the root causes. And then we prioritize those. So again, like you might have multiple hypotheses and then you establish, well, what do you think are the most prevalent causes for your population? And then we hypothesize and plan to test. So you'll create at least one hypothesis and make a plan to test it. And then when we think about change, <clears throat> this is just a really short GIF, there's, there's no sound. But this is the model that I use with my clients to help them do work. So we start with data, then we conduct root cause analyses, then we plan strategic interventions, we verify those interventions address the root causes, and then we evaluate those outcomes and then make a plan to do it again. And so this is based on Six Sigma process improvement, and this is something that you can learn to do. And so let me just show that one more time. This is how you can create change. So you explore the data that you have access to. You conduct those root cause analyses. You plan strategic interventions. You verify those interventions address root causes, and then you evaluate those outcomes and make a plan to do it again. And so why this is important and where we're sort of stopped, paused in this, in this effort is we're paused on this sort of root causes, assuming you've already accessed the data. And so this root cause, we then need to go verify that it's true. So as an example, um, a story that we often tell based out of some of this work that was done in Oregon is a group of educators, they wanted to understand why were students, girls, not participating in their welding class. And so they came up with some hypotheses and said, we think it's self-efficacy and role models. And then they went to test it. They went to interview the students, they did some surveying, and then what they found out is that that wasn't actually the case. What they found is that the girls said, we don't participate in welding because you don't have uniforms that fit us. And the educators are like, what do you mean we don't have uniforms to fit you? And why, what do you mean? Why is that a problem? And so they go and look at the uniforms and sure enough, they're all like larges and extra larges and the girls were much more petite and they had big you know, sort of gaping V-neck collars. And there had been, the girls had heard that you get burned from the welding because the uniforms don't fit you. So what they did is what they, they learned is that their hypothesis wasn't exactly correct. The reason why girls weren't participating wasn't because of these other things. It was simply because of the uniforms. So they spent $350, they bought <laughs> smaller uniforms. Then they did an active campaign to help the girls understand that, hey, we've got uniforms that fit you. And they went from two students to over 25 students. And that's the remarkable change. Like that is not a normal kind of change that we normally see when we do these kinds of efforts. But the, the, the narrative there helps us understand that unless we stop and go test those hypotheses, we they might have created this big problem, you know, this big solution and intervention to solve that, that wouldn't have actually addressed the root cause. So that's what the verification part is in the drive change model, is that you create an intervention, but you're constantly looping back to say, are we addressing the root cause? Are we addressing the root cause? Because otherwise you might be creating intervention that's just like feels good, but it's not changing anything. So how you can begin to do this is you can do focus groups, you can do interviews, you can do single surveys, pre and post surveys, you can look at exam scores, grades, you can measure attendance and participation, you can just do straight up observations, student journals, field notes, there's all kinds of different ways that you can collect data. And as you begin, as you begin to sort of plan your methods, you ask questions like this, who or what populations you need to ask to participate. How you identify participation participants and your action research and action research is what I call the work to test or validate your hypotheses. You've got to understand what are your constraints, what is your timeline. What is the data collection method that you want to use and how will you develop your instrument. So I have exciting news. I have a brand new instrument that has never been released to the public yet, and it is a brand new student survey generator. So I just finished this, I think uh, like a month ago, 
and we haven't we haven't broadly uh, shared it yet, but I created this in partnership with the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity in response to so often one of the, the biggest bottlenecks that I have with educators in trying to address these kinds of changes is that they want to create surveys, but the surveys aren't actually always measuring what it is that we want them to measure. And so this was a huge project that was funded by uh, the Toyota Foundation, the Toyota Education Foundation. And so, and you can access it. I'll eventually have it up on uh, my website, but we're just sort of in finalizing some communication strategy around it. But you can, I'm, I'm going to actually walk you through it, but the student survey generator is based on that hypothesis. So you create a hypothesis that says something to the nature of we think that Hispanic women don't participate in engineering because of um, whatever the root cause is. And then in this survey tool, there's a, a GIF here, but I'm going to actually show it to you in a little bit slower speed because this is kind of fast, is that you get to pick whether you want to create an open ended or a Likert scale survey. And that Likert scale survey is then you go through and you pick the root causes that you've already identified. So this is once you've kind of identified some hypothesized root causes that you want to go test. And then you go in and then you select, there are prompts <clears throat> that are based on each root cause and you select the ones that you like. And then at the end, we send you a, an email and the email, it replays what your hypothesis is. And then it, it lays out all of the questions that you've selected. So say that you selected career role models and mentors as one of the root causes. And this is based on NAEP's root causes and strategies document. And you selected these handful of, <clears throat> of, um, of prompts. And then the next task is that you copy and paste these into your survey tool, you massage them. And then what's also included in this document is we have um, attached, attached to it is are the best practices. Um, so we've got best practice guidelines that are attached to the email for preparing and administering your survey. And then there's also linked to a tool where you can learn how to get your data and disaggregate it. And, and ultimately it's a really cool tool that helps cut out a lot of the work for you. Um, so let me jump over to it. So again, this is the CTE and STEM student survey question generator. So we're gonna say start. So we start with the beginning of that hypothesis that we talked about. So what program course or pathway are you prioritizing for your data collection? It's a drop down list. So we're going to start with, um, we'll start with engineering because I like engineering. Um, I'm an electrical engineer. So we'll start with that. Are you focused on one of the following Carl D. Perkins special populations? So I already talked about what those were. So I'm going to say non traditional fields. <clears throat> What is the metric that you are trying to address? So again, some of these terms are Perkins based, but we'll just say participate in general. Are you focused on a gender population? Yes, I'm focused on women and girls. Are you focused on a racial group? I'm going to select all racial groups and ethnic origins for this. And so here's where you have a pivot question. You decide, do you want to do an open ended survey or a Likert scale survey? And I've got this image here that helps you understand, well, what's the difference? So open ended questions. Um, oh, that's really big. So open ended questions, they allow respondents to answer in their own words. Um, whereas Likert scale questions are closed ended questions that ask them to respond on uh, like a scale, agree their level of agreement, frequency, quality. The challenges to each is that an open-ended question gives you really rich data. However, it's harder to analyze. Now, I will say that using tools like ChatGPT 4.0 is pretty amazing in analyzing data. Um, and so I think I foresee a future uh, tutorial on that because I've been using ChatGPT 4 from OpenAI uh, to analyze data recently and it's been incredibly powerful and valuable. Um, 
the Likert scale questions could require a little bit of, you can do basic statistical analysis that doesn't require any fancy skills, uh, but because you can just do basic average and then compare and contrast. Or if you've got somebody on your team that has advanced stat skills, they can do that, but it's really not necessary. So I'm going to say I want to do a Likert scale. And so the next part is you start to select which hypotheses that you suspect. So one of the things from the earlier thing somebody said, lack of um, uh, encouragement. So we'll say, um, and if you're curious what these are, these actually come from um, NAEP's root cause document. And so this is another project that I was involved with for them. So you can access the full document here, but this gives you a summary of all of these root causes. Um, so we'll say just access and participation in CT and STEM. Um, and so then it's gonna let me pick some questions. And these are again, Likert questions that when you get the survey, it will have your population program in input here. So I could say, I'm aware of the electrical engineering programs available at my school. Um, and then the student would say yes or no. I feel like some electrical engineering programs are not for meant for students like me. Their curriculum and electrical engineering classes reflects diverse perspectives and cultures. Well, so again, I'm not going to read all of them, but you, you get to select the questions that you want. Click OK. And then if you have another root cause, you can select up to three here. So then I'll say um, role models and mentors is the second one. Um, I have role models in my electrical engineering field who come from diverse backgrounds and whom I admire. Having a mentor with similar background would help me succeed. So again, you've got a few options you can select. There's probably on average 10 per root cause. Um, Maria, I hope that you will tell me about how you're using it because um, I worked really, really hard on this. Um, I had this idea to do it because it's the biggest pain point. I'm going to go back to where you can see the QR code. It's the biggest pain point for me as a service provider in helping educators do this work because it's impossible for me to help everybody generate a survey. And even though I offer, people rarely ask me. Like my clients pay for coaching, they pay for this one on one time, but I don't know, people are afraid to ask. And so by doing this, this helps me help them by creating targeted survey questions that address to the root causes that we know are the issues. And so um, I'm really excited for people to try it. And so if you um, if, if you all try it, please, please let me know. Um, oh yeah, I. what's so funny is like, one of the sort of curses of being an engineer or a computer scientist is that you think you can do anything. <laughs> and sometimes things are harder than you think, but um, I worked on this for probably six months um, and and I, I'm really proud of it. And I'm really excited to tell you, you're the first people I'm telling about it. So, uh, so thank you for that. But um, so if I go back and, and finish, so I'll say, no, I don't wanna select an additional root cause. Um, this reiterates your hypothesis based on your input you think the individuals preparing for non traditional fields that's what you selected. Um, and then you selected women and girls all races and ethnic origins, you think that they don't, they don't participate in electrical engineering because of education access to and participation in TD and stem and, and role models and mentors. And then your survey your goal is for this to validate or disprove these root causes. So yes, you say this reflects the goal, you share your information with us, and then it will email it to you. <clears throat> We're asking here um, for at least your um, city, state, and country, because it's just uh, helpful for us to kind of track where people are using it. Um, and then it will send you an email. Now, fair warning, it takes a few minutes for all the data to process and for the email to land in your inbox. But it looks like it did in, in that video where um, it's got the, uh, let's see, so you can see here that it kind of looks like this with all the information there. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I hope that you'll find this useful because again, 
this helps you get to the bottom of things. This helps you get to that root cause and why. So after you've already done the analysis to begin to think about what it is that might be happening for your students, um, then you can actually ask them because asking them is really, really critical. So again, how this fits in with the drive change model is that this is part of the, the R it's validating those root causes so that the answers that you get from that survey, the answers that you get from that survey help you then design an intervention that's truly going to help you to address that. And so this is usually the funnest part is like, let's come up with all the program ideas and the interventions that we can create to really help students. And, and I have another tool that I wanna to introduce to you um, um let's see right. elizabeth if you can drop the drive change um link let's see i've got actually i've got that here for them so if you want to learn more about the drive change model and you can download a handout on that here um so you can um i would just drop that link in the chat um and so now I want to show you about the impact versus effort matrix. So this is where after you've you've established some root causes that you think are the are the actual issue, actual root causes, then you do some brainstorming to decide which intervention that you want to employ. And then I recommend that you use this impact versus effort matrix. And we just released this to our um, our mailing list, I think last week is when the first, when it went out to everyone um so this is a really short video that helps you understand how the impact impact versus effort matrix and so the, this talks about it being a compass for organizational change but the impact versus effort matrix can also be a compass for any deciding which intervention that you want to employ so you've made a long list of things that you want to do so you want to create a outreach program you want to create a mentoring program you want to create all these things and then you map them up on this compass so here have a have a look <clears throat> All right, so uh, the music was definitely not necessary, but I thought it was a great fit for that. So um, hopefully that was enjoyable for you. Now, <clears throat> I wanna, again, um, Elizabeth put the link in the chat for, for this, but I wanna pull it up um, on my website. So navigating organizational change so that you can kind of see the sort of next step and, and how you're putting all this together. So again, you can download a free guide on this from my website, but the 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 reason why you begin to map these things out and to use the sort of impact versus effort as a as a as a tool is it helps you make sure that you're spending your time and money on the most valuable things because if you again there's like you know we might call it sort of low hanging fruit i'm calling this the sort of golden opportunities those things that sort of quick wins things that you can do you want to find those and do those as your you know 
trying to map out your strategic plan for these kinds of things. Strategic investments, those are those heavyweight things that are going to have the, the biggest impact, but they might take more time and money to do. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the easy fixes, these are the low hanging fruit ones. And then the resource trains, these are things that you want to avoid. These are things that are high effort and low impact that are that might be things that you've been doing that you need to stop um, and or things that you might not even want to invest in. And so on the website, I encourage you to look because it helps you understand how you can use this and your decision making. Um, and then there are some real world examples here that you can dive into um, that span a variety of industries <clears throat> and, and different things. And again, here's a tool for how you can use the impact versus effort matrix. Any questions on these two? Again, there's lots of great content here on use cases by role um, that I encourage you to explore. And then this is where it integrates with the drive change model. So, um, and how you would how you would do all this together. So, any questions on the these two models that I presented to you as solutions? So you've got this drive change, you've got the five Y tool that you can use, you've got the impact versus effort matrix tool that you can use. And as you begin to understand things, <clears throat> you've got the survey instrument that you can use. What so I encourage you to access the links from my from the, the Elizabeth and I have shared in the chat there you've got lots of great handouts that you can access and, and how you can apply this. Um, and I'll make sure, uh, or, or we'll make sure that Brittany has those as well. So if there's any follow up to, to you all that she can include those um, in, in her communication with you. So with that, I want to remind you about the series. So again, here we are today talking about root cause analysis and why it's important and how to do it. Next time we're going to be exploring the top 10 root causes and I'll give you a teaser. So the top 10 barriers and root causes to access and success in CT and STEM is that we're going to learn the 4I model, uh, interlocking 4I models. We're going to learn how these systems of advantage and disadvantage become barriers that students face. How do we begin to recognize those barriers and recognize the ways in which the root causes are mapped to those. So you will talk about stereotypes and prejudice, bias, role models and mentors, feedback and support. Those are part of interpersonal. We'll talk about some of the institutional issues and how those show up and then internalized. So because we'll only have an hour and a half, we won't go super deep into all of them, but you'll get a, an overview of each of these different kinds of root barriers and root causes so that you can have um, you know, greater capacity when you're doing your own root cause analyses. And so then again, on March 5th, we'll have this conversation where we are talking about what we're learning. And then this, the final workshop are really practical strategies for engineering inclusion and belonging. Um, so with that, what I, I wanna open up and see if um, there are any, um, I guess this is this Q and A is it? opening, but let me check the, I don't see any questions on the Slido, so that's fine. Um, another resource for you is to go to nontraditional.careers. It redirects to, um, to my normal website, but there I have curated many different resources for um, nontraditional careers, including some posters and things like that. So what I want us to, to have you do first, and then we'll offer the breakout rooms, or, or if there's only a few people left, we'll do some one-on-one -on -one or sort of um, spotlight coaching to help you do a 5Y analysis of your focus area. And we'll go back up to the example that somebody shared earlier. But I want you to, before you shift your brain to other things, take a moment to reflect on what we've done today. Take a note of perhaps three things that you've learned maybe indicate two things that you'd like to do differently. And what's one immediate action item that you have? And I'd love to, to have you all report those out. But just think for a minute, again, this is just good adult, well, any, any kind of learning theory. But before you shift gears to like 
back to your job, how do you want to apply what you learned today? Maybe your action item is that you want to access the articles that we've shared. You want to read a little bit more. Um, maybe your action item is to do a 5Y analysis on a certain population within, uh, within your sphere of influence. So I'm going to give you a chance to share here, maybe what is your one action item? <clears throat> What's your one action item? All right, Sharon added in the chat that she wants to first find time to explore all this information and available resources. Excellent. Um, and I, if you happen to know anybody on the call, I encourage you to set up a meeting with them and maybe you both do it together, right? Dig through things um, and explore how you can use and apply some of these resources. We've got three people are typing. I'm excited to see the results. Sharon, again, thanks so much for being the first one to, to contribute there. So I challenge you, because I'm playing on your language, you want to first find time. I challenge you to block 30 minutes on your calendar to, today before you leave <clears throat> so that you can look back through the things that we've shared. Um, so you can go ahead and find time. Uh, find the time and then and prioritize that if you can. Um, <laughs> I know, it's life is wild. Um, but if, if you're anything like me, if it doesn't land on my calendar, it doesn't happen. And so I like to kind of block time. Uh, so somebody else adds in the slider that they want to ask questions and follow up with more questions. Um, so I don't know if you mean with me or with Brittany or with your students, the population that you're serving. Uh, but yes, always ask questions. I'm open and available to, to chat with you if you have any questions. Um, Somebody else adds looking into more CTE and STEM opportunities that we can promote to all of our youth also provide and create workshops to help express the importance of diversity. Um, so for the first one, I have a, a really strong connection with the University of Illinois uh, Bloomington, not Bloomington, um, Urbana-Champaign. I always get the Illinois universities mixed up. So if I just mix that up, I'm really sorry. I've only been working with them for six years. Uh, but they have amazing STEM opportunities. So um, if you're interested in any of those connections, please let me know. Um, you can follow the um, the WISE, W-Y-S-E. I think it's Women and Youth in Science and Engineering at Illinois.edu. Um, they have great programs and I've been a part of many of those over the years. So, um, and that's something that wouldn't be too far away for, for you all. Uh, to participate in um let me um let me find that link to wise um wise okay here it is so i again i've been working with this team for um for years, we just finished a five-year grant, um, um, but I'm hopefully going to be continuing with an, another five-year grant, providing student and teacher programs uh, that, that might be willing, you might be interested in participating in. Uh, so for the person who said they want to provide and create workshops to help express the importance of diversity need in the workplace, um, certainly I'd love to help you with that. If that if that's not feasible, I've got tons of resources on our on the website engineeringclusion.com. Um, I'm in the business of change, and I'm in the business of like making sure people have the resources that they need or want to be able to do that change. And so, um, I invite you to join my mailing list so that you can get some of those resources um, and learn more. Oh, oh my gosh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for reminding me about this. So, in line with the women in STEM sort of theme, but yet completely different than what I'm providing for you is we have uh, received a grant to we're running a panel three, a, a three panel series of conversations with women in STEM. 
Um, and so we're going to be talking about innovation and creativity and problem solving and persistence and failure. And so I um, hope that you'll join us for that. Um, so again, you can find that on the website. Um, Elizabeth just dropped it in the chat as well. But what so what I love about this panel series is one most of the women in the series are my friends and colleagues over the years. So we're going to be having some really fun conversations, but this is a panel it's a virtual it's no cost to attend it's designed for anyone so whether you're a woman or in stem or not. Um, we're really going to be talking about these are the things we're talking about innovating minds creativity and experimentation in stem resilience and innovation embracing failure and perseverance in stem and collaborative problem solving team dynamics and design thinking in stem so you can learn more about the panels you can read the bios of the people who are going to be presenting you just got stellar stellar people who are presenting um we've got folks who are seasoned in their careers and this is lauren horton she just graduated college uh, she, i was her mentor when she was at southern methodist university so she's just starting her uh, career at lockheed martin and then we we just got people from all across the 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 gamut um and so i hope that you'll tune into that if not if you join our mailing list then you'll make sure to receive the recordings of that um, again it's free to register you can download an event flyer here if you want to advertise it within your populations um, and so i hope that that's interesting to you and again what's going to be so great about it is like the content is not gender specific we're just talking about we're just talking about the work stem um, it's going to be really really fun and fantastic so um, i encourage you to join us there um, i also have um <clears throat> i don't have my book on my desk here but we have a book club dis uh reading community discussion today um and then we have them every couple of months or so and the book that it no reading is required um the book today is called designing for social change it's on my nightstand um but um it's at one o'clock today so elizabeth if you could drop that link if if you want to join us for that then for, especially for the person who's interested in delivering workshops that's a really good book for you to read um, i think it, it can really kind of help you especially if you want to create and facilitate some change within within your community um, so again we've got lots of great resources and opportunities i want to come back to these action items here so the next action item is to read and research in depth so that I may be able to provide insight as you visit the Perkins 5 team in the area is non-traditional discussed. Since I'm not on the program side, my first action is to share the series with your colleagues at the colleges. Fantastic. Well, with that, I want to thank you all so much for your time. Um, you have the opportunity to, to provide us feedback. We really value your feedback, especially because this is going to be a series for you all. I want to make sure that it's as valuable for you as possible. And so um, you can you can use that QR code or just go to um, engineerinclusion.com slash thanks. Um, to provide that feedback colleagues so share into your question in the ch chat spotlight coaching is i used we used to call it hot seat coaching but turns out that's the term hot seat is related to the electric chair and so i'm trying to stop saying that <laughs> that term so spotlight coaching is where you and I have like a, li a, a live exchange and then everybody listens. So the live exchange would be like, you tell me the sort of program area that you're thinking about. And then we live, you know, work through that sort of five why, and then everyone else who's present benefits from that. That's what spotlight coaching is. I know Maria, like I, I used to always say that. And then I, I'm on this sort of mission to like, what do things mean? Um, and I, so I'm trying to, you know, stop saying things that I don't want to reference. <laughs> um, so yeah, spotlight coaching. Well, if there's nothing else, um, Maria, Sharon, Lisa, or Clifton, um, again, just want to, again, thank you for your participation. We really value your feedback. It helps us improve our services. Um, and then I hope that you'll be able to take something away from what you learned um, and apply it to your practice. And so again, next time, 
uh, we're going to be doing um, the, the exploring the top 10 root causes. So you'll get kind of a um, mini lecture on, on those things so that they'll, they'll be able to help you improve uh, your root cause analyses. Awesome. Thanks so much, Maria. All right. Well, with that, Brittany, I'll hand it back over to you. I, um, I, I think, I think I can hand it back over to you now. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and I put in there a few times the flyer that has the links to register for the upcoming sessions. I'm also going to put my email address in the chat. Um, if you have any questions about some of the other sessions in this series, um, resources, any of that, feel free to email me. And then I will work to later this week, get the recording um, and some of the wonderful resources that were shared, uploaded onto our website and a follow-up email to everyone who participated so that you can have access to those. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Megan and Elizabeth, so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. And some wonderful information and lots of things that I know I'm going to be sharing with the ICCB and saying, hey, look at these that we can use and, and share with our, our programs. So it's been great. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone.